Well, it's good to be with you again this evening as we continue uh, our series through the life of, of Abraham, um, picking up tonight where we left off last Sunday night uh, in Genesis chapter 16. In Genesis chapter 16. Well, have you ever uh, had a problem or a difficulty in your life that you tried to fix on your own that you soon realized you shouldn't have tried that yourself? Or maybe it was a leaky faucet or a running toilet. Maybe it was something under the engine of your car or under the hood of your car. And you were like, oh, I got this. And you're like, I don't got this. I don't got this. This is worse. Um, I, I, I was reminded this past week of, of a movie that kind of plays off of this whole idea that oftentimes when we try and fix things ourselves, uh, we end up just making it worse. And it's a, it's a great 1980s movie star, starring a young Tom Hanks called The Money Pit. The Money Pit, if you've, seen, um, if you've seen The Money Pit, you know kind of the plot or the, the title gives it away. Um, and so Tom Hanks is, is in a relationship. This young couple decide they, they need to buy a house and they live in New York City and they find this amazing house, which is too good to be true. It's cheap. It's going for quick. And so they buy it, right? And they're so excited. It's their first house and they move in. Um, into this house. And, and so they go to fix some of the plumbing and they turn on the faucet and like this sludge comes out of the faucet. And they're like, I don't think, I don't think that's supposed to be like that. Um, we see early on as he's there, he's, the, the door was creaking. So he's kind of fixing the, the front door, messing with the hinges. And he's like, no sound. He's got it. And so he stands back and he shuts the door. And as the door shuts, the whole door frame of the house falls outside of the house. And he's just standing there looking as there's no, now no door frame in his house. That shouldn't have happened. He's fixing the stairs. And a few scenes later, um, his wife calls him upstairs and he goes to run up the stairs and literally the entire stairs fall apart as he's hanging on to the edge. And, and near the end of kind of this culmination of bad things happening throughout the beginning of the movie, he goes to turn on a light in the kitchen and we see this electrical fire follow the electrical wires through the kitchen. It's shooting tiles out at him. It's exploding blenders and toasters. And finally, he's so frustrated, he walks in to the bathroom. Remember, his water in the bathroom is sludge. So he's been heating water. He walks in with hot water and pour into the, to the, the bathtub. And he's like, I just want to relax and take a bath. And he pours the water into the bathtub and the bathtub shatters and goes through the floor onto the floor underneath him. Right? Everything that he tried to do to fix this house, to make it nice, to make it his own, was just leading to more and more difficulty, more and more problems. See, when we try and take matters into our own hands, it often leads to making things worse than they were to begin with. And when we try and take matters into our own hands, when it comes to the things of God, it always makes it worse. Right? When God gives us instructions on how to live and we say, well, yeah, but I'm going to try it this way, that never turns out good, yet it's something we all do. Right? It's something we all do. We take things into our own hands and we experiment ourselves. We're going to try it this way and it always turns out bad. We're going to see uh, tonight as we continue through the life of, of Abram, um, this kind of journey of faith that he's on. We see these miraculously great things that God leads him to do. And, and as we journey through tonight, we're going to see some things that we look at him and we're like, what? Why? Why would he do that? As, as tonight, we're going to see him and his wife, Sarah, start to take things into their own hands. They go with their own idea on following after God. And if you have your Bibles this tonight, would you please open them to the book of Genesis, chapter 16. Our entire text for the night um, is also in the handouts that, that you hopefully received when you, when you enter tonight. And as we're going to look at this, this story tonight, we're going to find, um, hopefully discovered together from this text, three actions to following God's will. Three actions that God would have of us if we're going to follow God's will for our lives. What are some actions that he wants from us? And so we'll, we'll jump in in the chapter 16, starting in verse 1. It says this, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. And if you've been with us over the last couple months, you've known this, and this is a big problem because one of the first things that God promised Abram, big, three big things, he promised him a land to live in, that he would be a blessing to people, and one of those is he promised, Abram, your descendants will be so great 
That if you could count the stars, you would still have more kids. That if you could number the sand on the seashore, you would still have more children. And we enter the story of Abram being 75 and he has no kids. And now we're several chapters in and we're still reminded that he still had no children of his own. It says in verse 1, continues, But she had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And if you remember in Genesis chapter 12, Abram walked in disobedience to God, went down, lied about his wife, said he was her sister, not his wife, to to save his own skin, ended up getting lots of servants and slaves and possessions. This is likely where Hagar comes into the equation and Hagar comes into his possession, into his household is as a result of his original sin back in Genesis 12 to begin with. And so Hagar is introduced And it says multiple times in the text tonight that to make sure we remember she's an Egyptian servant. It says this, verse 2, Sarai has an idea. And Sarai said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. So after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian, her servant, and gave her to, ha- to Abram, her husband, as a wife. The first action that we see here, the first action of following God's will, which goes against here what Abram and Sarai are doing, um, the first action of following God's will is that of trust. The first action that God wants from us in following his will is that of trust. See, it, it slides in there near the end that, that he's now lived in the land for 10 years years. And so God promised Abram something when he's 75, and he's reaffirmed this promise to Abram multiple times. Last week, we, Abram realized for the first time, is he's like, will the, the, the son of one of my servants, Eliezer, will he be my successor? And God says, no, it will come from you, Abram. You yourself will be his father. And so he's starting to realize this, but it's now been 10 years And if God promises something and tomorrow it comes true, you're like, oh, wow, God's faithful. That was easy. I always trust his promises. And if God promises something to you and 10 years later, you still have no idea what God's doing, somehow you're like, is he worth trusting? Is his way actually worth following? Because he said something would happen and and I don't see it coming to pass. And what Sarai suggests that that they do to take her servant and to go in and to have a child through her, notice that it actually says, this would then be my child, is a very cultural, strange thing for us that would have been perfectly normal back then. Right now, if, if a couple struggles with infertility, you don't come along and suggest, we'll just take one of your servants and that's how you have a child. Right? There's a whole lot of issues going along with that that would never fly in our world and our culture. But back then, culturally, that's how children were possessed. If you were the, the patriarch of your family and your wife couldn't have children, that was a very normal thing um, for them to do, a culturally acceptable thing. The problem was, that's not what God wanted. That's not what God had approved of. Already we know in Genesis chapter 2, right, he says, a man and a woman will come together and they will be one flesh. God doesn't want the violation of this marriage relationship. They know it, but what they do is they crack under the pressure of what culture says is normal and what God says is right. They crack under this pressure because they've been waiting on God and they're losing their trust because they don't see what he's doing. And immediately as we read this passage, where our minds are taken back to another circumstance that we know this isn't going to go well through some of the key words here in these first three verses. See, it says in verse, um, verse 3, I believe it is, yeah, that, that Sarai took Hagar and gave her to Abram. These two words have been used in a sentence before. In Genesis chapter 1 and 2, God created the heaven and the earth, and everything was perfect and sinless. And then the ultimate creation, he created man and woman as his image bearers, his reflection, and he placed them on earth, and they lived in perfect unity with each other and with God. And then if you're familiar with the story of Scripture, Genesis 3 comes along, and Eve is tempted by the servant. And their commands to not eat of this tree is, is he's tested, that, uh, he's tested Eve, and it says that Eve takes the fruit and gives it to Adam. Sarai takes her slave and gives to Abram the exact same 
words. The exact same action Eve did to Adam is the exact same action Sarai is doing to Abram generations later. And then it says, um, right after this, that Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. In Genesis 3.17, when God comes to offer judgment on Adam and Eve for disobeying him, the first thing he says to Adam is, Adam, you have listened to the voice of your wife. The exact same five-word phrase that Abram has now said, you have listened to the voice of your wife. And so immediately as we see this, our minds are taken back to Genesis chapter 3. Huh, some other time a wife took and gave and he listened and it didn't turn out well. Like it ruined all of humanity. And now the same thing is happening. They're taking, they're giving, and he's listening to the voice of his wife. But the pressure to do this on Sarai must have felt enormous in the culture that they lived in. And so much of faith and following after God is resisting cultural norms for something better that God has for us. See, what she was doing, her friends, the people around them would have been like, yeah, yeah, that's what you should do. Your husband's 85 years old. You're old. You're not getting any younger. You better make sure you have kids somehow. This is how we figure figure it out. Yeah, this is what we do. This is a culturally normal thing, Sarah. Yeah, you should do this. And so much of our world today, what it means of following faithfully after God, walking in God's will, is resisting what our world says are cultural norms versus what God has in store that's something better. See, our world, the culture that we live in, will always have things that disalign from God's word. Because culture is made by people, right? And people have always, since Genesis 3, been sinful. And so there will always be elements of a culture that will have some sort of selfish and sinful side to it. They go against what God wants. And it's all the way back here in Genesis. And in our world today, there are things that our culture says, this is okay, this is fine, that go against what God's word says. There's so much of it. And following after God is knowing that, that what our culture says is an okay thing to do is not necessarily what God's word says. And so our culture today would say, if you disagree with someone, it's okay to get angry, to attack them, to belittle them, that this is an okay thing to do, to make yourself justified in your opinion over them. And that goes contrary to everything scripture would have to say. In the matter of our sexual lives and what the Bible would say about our sexuality, almost everything the culture in our world would say about it is different than what God's word would say. And so much of following God's will is about discerning between what the culture says is fine and what God's word says is best. See, Sarai took matters into her own hands. A large difficulty in doing is that she, it seems, valued things over God. See, her desperation was to have a child. In this time and in this world, for a woman, this was kind of a sign that God had blessed you, that you had meaning. And a woman without a child in that time and culture was kind of like, what's the point of you living? What is your point? And she wanted a child more than she wanted obedience to God. Having a child is obviously a blessing of God, but she wanted the good blessing of God more than she wanted faithfulness to God. And the temptation that led her down this road was to replace serving God with finding the good things that God wants for us. And she strove after those rather than striving after faithfulness to God. And so she takes matters into her own hands. Instead of trusting after God, she relies on her own wisdom. And Abram certainly is guilty as well of going along. He's not some innocent bystander. Abram is certainly guilty as well of relying on own human wisdom rather than trusting in what God would say. They commit the sin of self-reliance. The sin of self-reliance is so easy to see in others, isn't it? Like we look at this story and we're like, what are Sarah and Abram doing? Like, what are they doing? It's so clear to us. And it's so clear for us sometimes when we, when we observe the lives of some of our family members or our coworkers or our friends, like, man, what are they doing? Why are they relying on their own wisdom rather than what God says? It's a lot harder when we think about ourselves. It's a lot harder to think, where am I sinning on self-reliance rather than entrusting God in all areas of my life? As I was reading um, this week, one person that I read, I was really struck by, and I love this, on how we can tell if we are self-reliant in our lives. 
As he said, the greatest way is to ask yourself this question, how much do I pray? How self-reliant am I? He says, ask this question, how much do you pray? And he said this, he, he says this, I quote, prayerlessness may be our greatest sin because of what it says about who we think is in charge. I'll say it again, prayerlessness may be our greatest sin because of what it says about who we think is in charge. And we commit the sin of self-reliance. And the easiest way to see that is in what areas of your life are you not committing to God in prayer? If you're a a follower of God here tonight, I hope that, that prayer is an ongoing and regular part of your life. But one of the things about prayer is I've never met a Christian who's very satisfied with their prayer life, right? Like, oh, I got prayer down. Yeah, I don't. We're all working at it. Because I think prayer is a a tangible way of learning to trust God. And none of us, short of eternity, will learn to trust God fully in everything. And so I want to ask you tonight, in what areas of your life do you lack prayer? Not does your whole life lack prayer if you're a believer, but if you're a believer, in what areas of your life do you lack prayer? Maybe it's in your work, in your career ambitions. You're going with what the world would say. Hey, work hard. Go up the ladder. These are all the things you need to do, and you're not committing these things to God. Maybe in your marriage. You're you're not praying over your marriage. Maybe in a relationship with your kids. Maybe in a relationship with a difficult person at work, a neighbor, a family member. You're going with what the culture would say to treat them rather than with what God's word would say, and you're not praying about it. Maybe in your finances. You're not spending time praying and asking God, God, how would you have me use this money that you've blessed me with? What area of your life lacks prayer? And that so often exposes the area of our lives that we rely on ourselves rather than trusting in God. Verse 4 says, And he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, she looked with contempt on her mistress. And Sarai said to Abram, May the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my servant to your embrace, and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with content. May the Lord judge between you and me. But Abram said to Sarai, Behold, your servant is in your power. Do to her as you please. Then Sarai dealt harshly with her, and she fled from her. The second action in following after God's will, the second action is the action of ownership. The second action, if we're to follow after God's will that he would desire from us, is ownership. See, in this passage, in these three verses, there's plenty of sin to go around and everybody looks bad. There's plenty of sin and no one here looks good. They all look bad. And so if, if, you, if you come and you're a Christian or maybe you're, you're just checking out church and you're like, wow, I thought the Bible was about like these great moral examples that were to follow. Well, welcome to the Bible. It's not about that. And if you read your scripture thinking, oh, I need to be like Abram or Abraham and Sarah, these great people of faith, and you come to this, you're like, what? What is this? What is this? You see, the Bible is not about an example to follow. The Bible is, hey, look at what God can do. Look at the God who pursues in the midst of our craziness and self-centeredness and sin. And so we don't look at this, we don't look at these stories and like, this is what we need to do. But we look at this story and say, this is what God has done. And so, so what, what happens in, in these three verses is that no one takes ownership of any wrongdoing. Did you notice that? No one takes ownership of any wrongdoing. And so Hagar is sinful in her attitude. It says that she looked with contempt on her mistress. We don't know exactly what this means, but it's clear that now there's an escalation of conflict, that relationally they aren't on the same page anymore, that she in some senses is pushing Sarai away. She's elevated herself, and it clearly has broken the relationship between the two of them. And so Sarai comes to Abram, right? And what does she do? She blames She plays the blame game. This is your fault. May it be done to you what you have done here. Whose idea was this? (laughs) Sarai's, right? She's like, it was you, it's your responsible, right? When she's the one who had the idea to begin with. So she passes the blame onto Abram. Abram, in verse five, just is like, eh, do whatever you want. He has this passive attitude towards sin, just kind of like, oh, let's 
Just go, it's back on you. Whatever you want to do to figure out the problem, right? He's like, happy wife, happy life. Go ahead, Sarah. Just take care, however you want. Just take care of the problem. Right? He doesn't stand up for what's right. He has this passive and apathetic attitude towards Sarai, towards Hagar, and towards the sin that he has committed. Now, this is astonishing because remember, they know that Hagar is pregnant. They know who the father is. Who's the father? Abram. They know that they did this, that the promised child would be theirs. And what is Abram's response to his own son? I don't care whatever you want to do. He's 85 years old. He's wanted a son his whole life. And his response is, eh, whatever. Just do what you want. And so then in response to that, Sarah, it says, dealt harshly with her. Again, we don't know exactly what this means. Maybe it just meant she was very rude, very offstanding to her. It could have meant verbal abuse. It could even mean physical abuse. The next time we see this phrase that someone deals harshly with someone else is a few years later in the book of Exodus, when Sarai's descendants, the people of Israel, are in slavery to the Egyptians. And we're told that the Egyptians dealt harshly with them in the book of Exodus, that they wouldn't provide the materials for them. They made them go out and get their own things. Notice the irony that the same next time someone is Sarai deals harshly with Hagar. And in a few hundred years, Sarai's children will be dealt harshly by the Egyptians. Where did Hagar come from? Egypt. Don't miss the irony and the sin that's not dealt with just goes in cycles and it keeps going around. And so Hagar does what would seem to be the natural thing. She leaves. She runs away, and we're going to find she runs actually towards home. She tries to head back towards Egypt. See, not dealing with sin, not owning up to any wrongdoing and sin in our lives just continues a cycle of passing it along to other people. In relationships, we see this with Abram and Sarah, and we see this in our own lives. That sin, if you're in a relationship, if you're in a marriage with someone, sin that's not dealt with in your relationship just keeps coming back and forth and hitting you both over and over and over again until both parties own it. In your relationships with your parents or your kids, things that aren't dealt with just keep coming back over and over and over and cycles keep repeating of hurts and sin and damage and bondage to sin because no one's owning the problem. And if sin is not owned, it just continues to flow around and hurt all parties involved. See, the core of what it means to be a follower of God is owning up to the sin in our lives. There will be no one in heaven who does not own their sin here on earth. There will be no one in heaven who does not own their sin here on earth. Because Jesus has come to free us from sin. But the Bible says this, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. Confess literally means if we say the same thing about our sin that God says about our sin, then he's faithful and just. And if we live our lives here on earth denying any wrongdoing, denying our sin, then ultimately we don't have salvation because we don't need a savior because we're good how we are. This lifestyle and and temptation to deny wrongdoing just piles up so often in our lives, and it's so natural for us. When I was in college, I went to school here in Chicago, and I lived on a 19-floor dormitory, and each floor had about 30 guys and one little lounge kitchenette area in the middle. All right, now I don't know about you, but in my house, there's two of us in my house, and if we don't do dishes for like two days, it's like, what tornado hit the kitchen? Right now, multiply that by 15 guys in age 18 to 23. So, I mean, most of us ate in the cafeteria, but still, if you wanted a snack, if you wanted to get a coffee cup, right? And, and the natural thing to do, right? 18 to 23 year old guys, sometimes stereotypes are true. Mom's not there to clean up after them anymore. They just chuck it in. Their whole lives, the dishes have magically been clean and put away. So, of course, that continues, right? When we're in college. And so, the, the dishes at our, they were always backed up. There was always dirty dishes everywhere. And one of, um, one of my RAs was like, man, we got to make, this is like the only hangout area we have. We got to make this nice. We can't let dirty dishes. That's just rude, right? It's rude to always come in and every dish is dirty. Just do your own dishes. And he gave us like this big, long, inspired lecture and speech at the beginning of the year. It was very good. Two days later, dishes are full. 
right? He, he's ticked. He calls another meeting. He's like, everybody get in here. And he's so angry. Everybody get in here. And he's like, all right, this is not hard. When you do a dish, when you have it dirty, you take it, you wash it, you put it away. Does everyone understand? And then he goes around and all of our, all of our floors in the room, and he goes, all right, I want to ask, this is a judgment-free zone. And he goes, did you, are any of these dishes yours? No. Are they yours? No. He went around to every person. Are they yours? And everyone's, no, no. No, he's like, okay, so I'm, assum- I'm assuming that other people are coming down and using our dishes and leaving them here just to mess with us then, right? Because of the 30 of us who live here, none of us have used a dish today. Because we just naturally, right, deny, oh, no, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. It's, don't blame me. Pass it off on someone else. It was them. And that's our natural attitude towards so many sins in our lives. See, for some of us tonight, I challenge you, maybe you've never owned up to the sin in your life. See, when we, when we say to own up to the sin in your life, what I'm asking you is not to leave here tonight full of guilt and shame and despair at how bad of a person you are. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is God is a God who sent his son, Jesus, who died and who took the place for sin. But until we acknowledge that we need a savior, and that he alone can be our savior, we never will be free from our sin. And so don't own your sin to to make yourself feel more guilty, but own your sin to give it to the only one who can take your sin, and that's Jesus. But for those of us who are Christians tonight, can I encourage you tonight to own up to the ongoing sin in your life today? We so often find ourselves thinking or saying things Like, well, that's just how my family is. That's just my personality. It's your fault that I acted that way. If you wouldn't have done that, then I wouldn't have done this. We're blaming. We're denying. We pass off sin. And I challenge you, especially in in relational environments, the closest relationships you have, the undealt with sin just continues and cycles and hurts all parties involved. And so it starts with us owning our sin, not like Sarah and Abram, who just denied and passed off blame towards others. So Hagar leaves. Verse 7 says this, The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur that's headed down towards Egypt. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, excuse me, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, behold, you are pregnant and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael because the Lord has listened to your affliction. He shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him, and he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. So she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, you are a God of seeing. For she said, truly here I have seen him who looks or sees me. Therefore the well was called Berlahai Roy, it lies between Kadesh and Barad. And Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called the name of his son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. The third action that God wants in following his will, the third action is that of obedience. First, the action is that of trust. Second action of that is of ownership. And the third action is that of obedience. And Hagar does as we likely would do as well. She leaves, she runs out into the wilderness, the desert. Now here is a slave girl, pregnant, on her own, in the desert. The prospects of survival are very low. The prospects of thriving are certainly very low as well. She's desperate. She's alone. She's abandoned. No one sees her. She's on her own. And notice who takes the initiative. God. It says the angel of the Lord found her. It's not that she found God. God went out and he found her. And the angel of the Lord shows up here. Angel literally just means the messenger of the Lord. Sometimes in scripture, we're told who these angels are, right? There's my favorite, Michael, 
He's obviously the best because he has the name Michael. That must, he must be the best, right? Um, you have Gabriel. You have, you have other angels. But sometimes an angel of the Lord simply means a messenger of the Lord. And, and scholars are, are trying to figure out who exactly this is. And it's clear here that this isn't just any angel because in verse 10, he says this, I will surely multiply your offspring. In verse 13, after seeing this angel, it's clear to Hagar that God, I have seen God. I've seen him. And this is what what theologians would call a theophany or, or a manifestation, a physical manifestation of God himself. God himself comes down to Hagar in the wilderness. And God blesses Hagar. Right? Remember, if, if, you're, if one of the status symbols, especially for women in that age, is having children, look at what he says. You're going to have a multitude that cannot be numbered. You're going to have a multitude. This is huge blessing. It's not going to be an easy life for your son, that he says here in verse, uh, verse 12. But you will be multiplied. God, and I love this, this name here, you shall call him Ishmael, which literally means God has heard you. Because the Lord has listened to your affliction. But then he says this shocking thing in verse 9. Return to your mistress and submit to her. Return to your mistress and submit to her. See, from Genesis chapter 12, right at the beginning, remember, blessing was tied in one's relationship to Abram. And when anyone went against Abram, bad things happened. When anyone was with Abram, good things happened to them. They were blessed. And this was God's pattern. And so he's, blessing is tied to one standing to Abram because Abram is the representative of God. God is with Abram. And so she is instructed to go back to Abram. Now, please don't read in. He's not saying to go back to every hurtful relationship in your past. He's not saying that it's okay to be hurtful and abusive towards people and to go back. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying slavery is good and you should go be a slave again. That's not what he's saying. That's not what the Bible teaches. But the point is, what is it saying? What what God is teaching us here in this passage is the point of our greatest blessing is always in obedience to God. And so obedience to God for this time meant you need to go back to where you fled from, where it was difficult, where you were being dealt harshly with, for it's there that I will bless you. And you don't know what that means. You don't understand how I can and can't do that. But you need to go and obey, and there you will have blessing. The point in our lives, the point of our greatest blessing, is always found in obedience to God. This passage calls us to obey God no matter what it looks like the outcome in our lives may be. There's a very cool scene um, from an old 90s movie that I remember, The Hunt for Red October. Um, Kind of an early Jack Ryan uh, kind of action drama movie. Lots of the guys in here are like, oh yeah, now we're talking, right? Um, In the movie, there's this Russian submarine captain and we love him because he's played by Sean Connery and he has an awesome accent, right? And so he's Sean Connery, right? So that was awful. I'm sorry. So, so he's this really cool guy and he's going to, to defect over to the Americans. And there's like this, this kind of back and forth as they're like the whole thing is on these submarines and they're back. And he finally gets aboard with the Americans and they're going to take away when suddenly there's a torpedo in the water coming at their ship. And now when a torpedo is in the water, what do you do? You go full speed ahead. You take evasive action to get as far away from it as you can. And this captain calmly says to him, turn around. And everyone on board looks at him and is like, excuse me? He goes, turn around. I'm the captain here. I'm the commander. Turn around and head towards it. And they're like, what? He goes, go full speed towards it. And they're like, you're killing us. What are you doing? This makes no sense. We don't see how this ends well for any of us. What are you doing? And as the torpedo is heading full speed ahead, there's guys in the background counting down, right? 30 seconds to impact, 25 seconds to impact. He like looks at one of these Americans who kind of has played a key role and he goes, so what books did you write? And the guy gives him this look like, we're 20 seconds from death and you're talking to me about the books that I've read? What are you talking about? And the moment comes, of course, the music is tense and it it hits the torpedo and it just kind of bounces away and nothing happens. And they look at him and he's like, it's a Russian sub. I know that they have to send at a certain distance before the weapons will equip themselves to explode on impact, right? And they're like, Oh my goodness, because he actually saved their life. And what they all thought was he was doing something insane, but because they followed him, they obeyed what he was doing, it actually worked to their advantage. See, there will be times in our lives where obedience to God makes, from our perspective, no sense. 
It doesn't seem like the outcome of obeying God gives us any benefit or any help at all. In fact, at times in our lives, we're not quite sure what we should do. But I think it's true that in our darkest time, in our desert where Hagar found herself, in the wilderness of life, God always gives us enough light to obey him. He doesn't give us enough light to know what he's doing. He doesn't give us enough light to see how obedience to him will benefit us in the long run. But in our darkest of times, God always gives us enough light to obey him. And as Hagar obeys God, she sees here that God is a God of seeing. She says, God is a God who sees. See, this is so important for us to know because there's times in our lives, perhaps it's for you right now, where you don't see God. Right, where, where we don't see God. And in this story, there's this profound comfort that in the midst of any situation, any wilderness, we find ourselves in. If you're outcast and alone and abandoned, this truth remains that God is a God who sees us. God is a God who sees us. This past week, I was um, looking at Facebook and I came across a post by, by one of my friends um, who talked about she had gone on a field trip recently with, I believe, her, her son's in kindergarten. And so they went on this field trip, and of course, she wanted to let, kind of let her son go ahead and play and make friends. It's the beginning of the school year, right? So she kind of hung back, and she said it was interesting how every few minutes her son would turn around to make sure he could still see mom. And he, he wanted to still see mom. And so she, of course, is interacting with their parents, but always kind of keeping, keeping her eye out. And she said once in a while, she noticed her son would turn around, and in the chaos and confusion that is kindergarten life, he didn't see mom. She's like, this look of like panic and dread was on his face. Like, because oh, oh, oh. when you're five and you don't see mom, you're like, I'm done. Mom left me. I'm lost and alone in the world. What's going on? But she always knew where he was. And at those times, she would come, right, and find him or mind. Hey, I, I see where you are. I see you. You're fine. You're good. Keep playing. I see where you are. See, we often think it's the utmost important thing in our lives that we can see and perceive what God is doing, but that's not true. The most important thing is not if you can see God, but can God see you? It's not if you can see what God is doing, but does God see you? Can God see you? The answer to that question is yes. In the middle of your anxiety and depression, God sees you. In the midst of loneliness, doubt, and fear, God sees you. In the midst of sin and disobedience, God sees you. In your wandering, in your wilderness, God sees you. Friends, we are not alone. For just as Hagar experienced back then, God is a God who sees you. He sees us. He knows our hurts and our pain. And he's come for us. Some of you tonight maybe wonder if you're alone in what you're going through. You're not. God sees you. God, we thank you that you are indeed a God who sees and a God who hears us. God, we pray that you would give us the ability to trust in you and not to take matters into our own hands. But God, we thank you that when we sin and when we wander astray, that you're not a God who just waits, you're a God who goes after us, a God who pursues us. And no matter how far we may run, no matter how far many of us feel tonight, like we've run from you, you see us and you will always hear us. We thank you for your faithfulness in our lives, God. Pray us all in Jesus' name. Amen.